Hello, Angry Spork here with episode 22 of season 3 of Young Justice, Antisocial Pathologies, which sounds like a class I think I'm late for. Which is weird, because I'm not signed up. We begin with a meeting amongst the light. Vandal Savage standing in a room full of monitors with uh, Queen Bee and Granny Goodness and Ultra Humanite. And Granny's saying that the heroes seem to be more coordinated with each other then they've let on to the public, like, you know, the Outsiders and the team and the Justice League proper is basically what she's getting at. She brings up Halo and Ultra Humanite is like, hey, 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 I called dibs. That's how the light works. That's tradition. I called dibs. Halo's mine. And Granny's like, okie dokie. But what about the Markov children? And so we go to Hollywood where Tara is walking alone at night on the streets. Not sure how safe that is, even for a girl with superpowers. And she gets, you know, grabbed from behind, her mouth discovered, gives her a nice flashback to when her bodyguards were murdered and she was originally abducted. Yikes. And it turns out that it's Deathstroke. He knows that she's been holding some information back and now, as the saying goes, she got some splaining to do. Tara says that she hasn't mentioned things about Halo or Cyborg because those are developing situations, but uh, Slade senses something else. He thinks that she's going soft, she's beginning to think that these new heroes that she's joined up with are really her friends and they genuinely care about her, but he's like, they're gonna treat you the same way your brother did when he took you to London and he left you alone to get kidnapped while he was off clubbing and he, uh, and how her parents didn't do anything to look for her when she was abducted. Basically playing with her head. And it does remind me of when he did the same thing to Cassandra in World War III. Yeah, he's definitely manipulating her. And he put something in her hand saying, while saying, like, he's always been straight with her. He's been tough for her own good, but he's always been straightforward with her and gives her something we don't quite see just in case. Grayson's in the med bay, his body is spasming, his brain is swelling, so Tim, Bruce, Alfred, and Barbara are all there. No costumes. While this is going on, uh, Beast Boy and the Outsiders are all having a pancake dinner or something. It seems to be nighttime, maybe it's at... There's this video of this new group called Infinity Inc., who Brion thinks are basically stealing the Outsiders' shtick. Halo tries to bring him down and say, hey, you know, they're doing good like we are, isn't that more important? He's like, okay, yeah, that's a positive way to look at it. But then the conversation goes to what's going on with Grayson and uh, how Halo can't use her powers to heal him. They've given him a wide berth for his family and friends, and Brion's like, is, is Dick's father Bruce Wayne? Beast Boy stops him. Before he can finish, he's angry that Granny did this to him. So they decide they're going to find out, you know, what's going on. And go back to the Hollywood base. And Jace, you know, Dick is covered in ice to keep the swelling in his brain down. Jace gives the Bat family a moment. She can't figure out what's going on. Outsiders enter. So the Bat family, Sans Alfred, he's with Grayson, uh, go with Calder and Miss Martian. They have a private chat and... Pierce just watches them for a moment, has a few flashbacks to previous episodes, and basically puts all the pieces together in time to chew them all out, saying that, you know, they've been secretly coordinating with one another, that Batman quitting the League was probably part of the plan. He's angry at Calder for being in on it, and saying that the assault in Brooklyn was all a play. He does you know, angrily exposit what they've been doing, especially from his perspective, for everyone to hear. And Calder tries to say, it's not as bad as you think. Uh, Jay slaps a control t uh, disc on the back of Tara's neck and tells her to follow her. I think Jace is evil! Though, on the other hand, I think it's entirely possible that maybe she's not so much evil as she's being misguided for one reason or another. Maybe. So Vandal Savage is alone in the monitor room when suddenly a boom tube opens, he walks through it, and he's face to face with Dark Side. And then we jump back to Hollywood because, of course we do. 
Jace is taking Halo to a car, saying, Hey, my mentor found a cure for your condition. And in the back seat is, uh, Brionin, also Tara. And Halo's like, they, 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 don't, they don't know. Oh, don't worry, I already told them about it. <laughs> Liar! Halo does not pick up on the fact that, they, that these two spoke in unison, uh, briefly. She, she doesn't seem suspicious at all. She's just happy. Oh, they know, and there's a cure, and oh, happy days are ahead. <laughs> of course, Brion's got another patch on his neck. Even while in this state, Tara again flashes back to training with Slade, something she did when they bumped into each other earlier. In that first flashback, I suspected something that they confirmed in the second flashback. Um, while he's... You know, Slade says that he liberated Tara from her abductors when... Her country and her parents couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, liberated, huh? <laughs> right. They're training with bow staffs, and he's basically pushing her to be better, and then she uses her powers to try smacking with a huge chunk of earth. And at first he seems like he's mad, but no, he's actually very proud that she improvised in that way, because that's what she's going to have to do in the real world. He says he's proud of her, and she hugs him, and it's... Oh, it'd be so sweet if he wasn't a psychotic liar. So, while Fred sits... <laughs> Fred actually sits down with a bucket of popcorn that he shares with Cyborg. <laughs> well, in uh, a room they can't hear it, uh, Pierce is chewing out uh, Calder and Bruce... McGann and Superboy are having a psychic argument, <laughs> really saving on the voice actors there, and <laughs> Beast Boy is chewing out Tim and Barbara, and like saying, telling Tim that his relationship with Wonder Girl is probably going to be over when she finds out. Uh, hey, he's got Stephanie. Back up! Of course, that's not how Tim would see it. Uh, a well-written Tim, anyway. Oracle says that they didn't set up what happened in Brooklyn, only that they teed things up for the outsiders to make a good impression. And Beast Boy was like, hey, we didn't need that. Look how Dublin turned out. The little girl was McGann and the father was Bruce. Of course, you know, Garfield's angry about all this, how secretive they're being, because the outsiders were about being open to the public so that Medikids could have someone to look up to. But Barbara's like, hey, listen here. You had some secret uh, connections of your own that you're not telling the public, and... What they've been doing, trying to take on the light on the down low, has always been in the best interest. And Garfield begins to see her point. Pierce storms out of that room, and Bruce is like, Hey, I'm not going to apologize for doing what's best for the mission. And Pierce makes the point that what good is the mission if you lose yourself and who you are in trying to accomplish it? Which is not a bad point to make. And then... For whatever reason, Alfred is helping Grayson out into Promenade, I guess you could call it. Dick says, you're probably really mad at me. So Jace is taking the kids to this lab and tells Halo to lie in this chair. And they're going to start the procedure very soon. Then Halo, just she has a recollection of some kind that really freaks her out, just as Granny Goodness and the Ultra Humanite walk in. And... Violet seems very much ready for a fight until Granny tells Overlord in a nice little box to put a psychic collar on her. I think it was a psychic collar. She calls it a collar, but it's like a visor that goes over her head and makes her very complacent. Between the grumpy ultra-humanite and the very sweet little Granny goodness, Jace gets the impression that she hasn't exactly been told the whole truth. Apparently, Halo's gonna go with Granny and Ultra Humanite has to settle for Cyborg, and Granny takes them into takes them all uh, into the X Pit, protected in that little box. She explains what it is. It's basically a disciplinary dimension that affects mind, body, and spirit, and uh, that's where she takes her masters, orphans, and so forth. But it's not a perfect process. It can't terminate free will the way it's supposed to. No, it it impermanent, she says. So she just shoves Halo into the X-Pit, and she instinctively activates her healing aura, but it's not really doing much. And so after a lot of exposition and some confirmation by Overlord, it turns out that Halo's unique mother box human hybrid physiology is the key to answering the anti-life equation. Oh, joy! 
We briefly go back to Hollywood. Bruce is on a balcony and Barbara joins her. Bruce wishes that Pierce understood he was only trying to protect him by keeping him in the dark and everything. And Barbara says, you know, she's not like trying to escape culpability here because she knows that it was a seven-way agreement between all of them. But she wonders if Bruce is considering the fact that with Diana out in space, the group he's put together is entirely uh, his protégés, who are or former protégés in general, in Calder's case, who are used to following his orders. And she asks, is this about the mission or about his mission? So back in the pit, uh, Jace is wondering just what the anti-life equation is, so Granny helps explain it by pushing her inside. Halo instinctively envelops her in her healing aura. Granny explains that because the mother box is inhabiting a biological form, it does not have the mechanical inhibitors Metron put into mother boxes and father boxes. She tests this out to by telling Jace to uh, reveal certain secrets to her kids. And at first she's resistant, but she goes on this big spiel about how she doesn't, that she basically thinks the Markov kids are hers because she subjected them to the tar that turned them into metahumans, so they were reborn as her children. So in the Halloween episode, when Jay said she had a daughter, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she was talking about Tara, because Tara was taken away from her, and she swore revenge on Bedlam. She tested Gabrielle for the metagene, came up negative, so she figured she wasn't useful anymore and decided to kill her with an overdose of morphine. When she showed up again, she's like, hey, a new child, fall for me! And then she realized later that, no, this is basically the uh, mother box human hybrid. And she says, well... Can't have that. Can't have that dating my son. So she decided to lie about her deteriorating condition and drive a wedge between her and Brion. And you can see that Brion is reacting a couple of times throughout all this. Even though he's got a submissive patch on his neck, he, he seems to not like this news. She explains that she'd been promised by the Ultra Humanite for Path to take the Markov kids with her to expand their family. So she's not simply evil, she's cuckoo bonkers nutso. So they return to the lab, and Granny's all happy that, you know, they finally got the anti-life equation, life without free will that Darkseid can use. She's confirmed that even though Jace hates her guts, she's still gonna do whatever Granny says. And Tara reveals that she's not under anyone's control right now. The, what Slade put in her palm was a chip that apparently countered the one on her neck, so she plucks out the one from the back of Brion's neck, and they start a simultaneous attack. He <laughs> basically makes the floor lava, she lifts up the four of them on a platform, and Granny escapes through one boom tube with Halo. Ultra Humanite opens up another one with the father box, and leaves with Jace. Boy, is their mission report going to be awkward. So, at the Hollywood base, Grayson, I guess, has just finished talking to Pierce, you know, to trying to make him see. Pierce has basically had enough. He, he doesn't want to deal with any of this anymore. He, he's done with everyone. And Brion and Tara walk in. Pierce wonders, where's Halo? Where's Helga? <laughs> Funny story about that. There's another meeting of the Light where the Markov kids are confirmed to still be in the situation the Light wants them to be in, and Ultra Humanite uh, says that, well, they were never going to agree to Jace's terms under any circumstances, but she doesn't know that, thankfully enough. Well, thankfully enough for them. And, uh, and then he mentions that how, how the um, power in the universe will shift dramatically once Granny gives this key to the anti-life equation to Darkseid, and the mention of the equation just really rattles Vandal Savage. <laughs> he, he doesn't say anything, but, you know, he, he breaks like a tablet he's holding. He's like, uh, dang it, Darkseid. And at the Hollywood base, Jefferson's just been told that basically everything, that Jace betrayed them all, that she basically seduced him 
to further her own ends, which uh, I'll talk about that mo in a couple minutes. And uh, he he's just he's extra done now. He he just walks out. He tells he just yells them, "Don't follow me!" Walks right out. And then we go to the orphanage in space. That's where Gretchen Good is handing Halo off to Granny Goodness. I'm confused. And the last shot we get of the episode is Tara on the balcony, on her phone, telling, obviously, Deathstroke that, yeah, you were right, the heroes betray each other at every turn. Okay, that was a bit more vampire than I thought. But anyway, she's uh, she, she, she wants to know what she can do next. And then the end credits roll over this empty chair with a picture of Brion, Halo, Cyborg, and Forager at Halloween. Presumably, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be uh, Violet's room. You know, because she's gone now. Not a lot of action in this one, but... Uh, and I did have a hefty helping of exposition. I thought that it got a little clunky at times, but I think it was the best way to get across what's been going on. Uh, the fallout between Beast Boy, Pierce, and the Batman Inc. Garfield's gotten pretty big for his britches, if you ask me. I'm not sure... I just... I don't know if it was developed as well as it could have been. Like, why he thinks he's uh, ready for this kind of thing. and But I can understand why he's upset that secrets were kept from him. <clears throat> and Pierce is like, oh man, he's just... He's just been beaten down this episode. First, he, he realizes that uh, everyone's been played by Batman. And then his girlfriend turns out to have just been using him. Fantastic. Though, on that note, maybe I am forgetting something from a previous episode. I just don't know how sleeping with Pierce really accomplished what she wanted. She already had Brion's confidence, and she already had history with these kids, and she has her medical expertise. Maybe she wouldn't get a little bit more scrutiny if not for Jefferson, but I'm just not seeing where the fake relationship was necessary is all. And I did notice that uh, Pierce mentioned Batman Inc. again. When he first said it early in the season, I just brushed it off as kind of like a, a, a wise crack. But now it seems to be more of an official thing, like something Batman actually has established. But there's been no other indication other than Jefferson saying it. I guess you could say that because Batman has his secretive group with Tim and Barbara and Grayson and, uh, you know, that squad with Arrowette and Spoiler and a version of Cassandra Cain that, you know, maybe that constitutes Batman Inc. But it's a very, very subdued Batman Inc. compared to the comics. We've gotten a few more mysteries solved, a couple more mysteries added, I mean, it's probably going to turn out that Gretchen Good's like a clone or something. Maybe they want to play, like, uh, the, by some weird cosmic happenstance, Gretchen Good is a human that looks exactly like Granny Goodness from Apocalypse. <laughs> I kind of doubt it. We get a little bit of dark side here. One criticism I definitely have this season is that it kind of very quickly went from this uh, meta-teen trafficking thing and the... Uh, and the connection to Darkseid, to Outsiders hashtag trending! I, I understand why they're introduced, they're, they've got the social media angle. I just, it just seems like a very, like they just take a sudden detour, and it seemed like for a while that was the road they were going to travel for the remainder of the season. So this gets us a bit more on track. A lot of things to think about. And I really hope this doesn't hurt Superboy and McGann's marriage. Come on. Just don't do this to them. Also had a nagging feeling like maybe they were going to kill off Superboy in some dramatic sacrifice like they did with Kid Flash, but I don't think that's going to happen. 
So anyway, I will see you for the next episode. Later.